Bob, thank you for all those kind words. So I'll be nice to you when I talk, talk about uh, facilities management and what it, what it, what it means to the, to the college and stuff. Um, Dr. Cromwell, I don't believe we have met, but I want to thank you because I understand you were the chair of the awards committee for this and, and I appreciate uh, what the committee did. This is quite an honor. Uh, Holly, you did another fantastic job writing. Thank you. And um, my relationship with the dean, with Dr. Cox, goes beyond the fact that she, I think, nominated me for this award. As we've had a great working relationship since she came here as assistant dean. And beyond that, as a friend. And if any of y'all ever go to Suggins on a Friday afternoon, you may see us toasting each other with, a, with an adult beverage or something like that. She also allows me and my wife to park in her driveway uh, if we attend a football game or as we will be attending Roundup this weekend. Uh, she has also offered that, so uh, appreciate that very much. Uh, this recognition is very special. Um, in 2012, Holly was helping to do that application for the uh, Distinguished Alumni Award. And Dr. Carter, who nominated me, they were having a bit of a trouble because they didn't see on my resume or CV a lot of awards, medals, trophies, this, that, and the other. Um, although I have been involved on numerous boards within the thoroughbred industry and other agricultural groups, um, I've also done a number of board work in the community on uh, nonprofit things. And what I told Holly at that time, and it's, it's uh, pertinent for today as well, is that I found a quote of President Truman's that I thought fit my personality because the one, and you all probably have heard it, it's amazing what you can achieve when you don't care who gets the credit. It's always been my philosophy to get the job done no matter who, let someone else get the credit. I don't mind that at all as long as we get the job done. The diagnostic lab was one of those things. I was a part of that. I wasn't the person for it, but I was a part of it. Um, so I've kind of lived my life that way. Uh, have been criticized by one of my former presidents of the association who was a good friend. He criticized me that I didn't take, get enough credit that the association didn't get credit for all the things that we did. I couldn't disagree with him because I assume in association management courses, which I had none, uh, that they probably teach you that you need to be able to tell your members what things you've championed, what things you've done. Give them some reason for paying $100 a, a year for their dues or something like that. But, I, but I, I, I pretty well stuck with it and I think my successor, Chauncey Morse, is, is in the back of the room and I think he still has my sign on his wall in his office that says that. So what I want to talk to you all about is a little history of the industry, particularly the thoroughbred industry, getting some uh, the economic impact of it, which uh, Dr. Stowe has uh, done a study with et al's. I had to put that in there. Uh, and, and Dr. Gargovich also did a study. The, these things are very, were very important uh, for our industry. Um, and then I want to end up by talking about relationship. Relationship between our industry and the college in particular. Uh, now, when I start talking about uh, how did we become the horse capital of the world, I take the liberty of giving some facts, some fiction, and embellishment. <laughs> so how did Kentucky, Central Kentucky in particular, become the horse capital of the world? Well, it started off as a result of two wars. You know, many times out of adversity come positive things. And I'll touch on a couple of those situations uh, this afternoon. But first was the Civil War. And when the armies began escalating their battles on the Maryland, Virginia, and the Carolinas, the plantation owners who had wonderfully bred horses and wanted to protect them, the armies were raiding the plantations looking for food, clothing, and transportation. And transportation was the horse. So the plantation owners wanted to protect their horses, decided to try and get them out of harm's way, and they moved them west. And many of them ended up right here in the bluegrass area. 
and as Dr. Lawrence will attest, the soil structures, the calcium, phosphorus, and magnesium that you teach the students in your class, the prevalence of it in, in our soils when they eat the legumes, when they used to drink the water out of the streams, uh, would help to build strong bone. And the underlining undulating terrain that we have is something that our foals when they're 24 hours old uh, are turned loose with their mothers to go up and down these hills and they start building their muscle. Well, that's that's what we believe these plantation owners saw when they came to maybe take their horses back but they decided to leave them here uh, and that's how we started from that one. The second was a result of World War II. During World War II there was a restriction on movement by rail. The only thing that they could be used for were for troops, munitions, and supplies. Well, the thoroughbred breeders in central Kentucky were used to sending their horses to Saratoga Springs, New York, because New York was the population uh, on the East Coast, sure. Well, they couldn't do that, so instead they encouraged the buyers uh, in New York to come to Lexington because they started a sales company called the Breeders Sales. We're going to fast forward from that because today you all know that company as Keeneland, the Keeneland Association. Keeneland Association is the world's largest auction house for thoroughbred horses. Last year they sold over $535 million worth of horses. Casey Tipton sold about $180 million worth of horses right here in central Kentucky. They just finished Two weeks of selling about 2,700 head of horses uh, at Keeneland, $281 million. That is more money than any other auction company will gross in an entire year, what they did in 12 days. These little things are what allows me to say we are the horse capital of the world. Let me revert back just a minute. How did we, how did we come up with that slogan of horse capital of the world? I made it up as a marketing ploy. Years ago, my counterpart in Ocala, Florida, was claiming to be the horse cap of the world, and, and, and I said, now this can't be. He actually tried to trademark that name, and uh, they, you cannot trade such a name. He wanted me to be the thoroughbred capital of the world. But that wasn't going to fit into my personality, <laughs> because it, as Dr. Harmon said, Many of the things that I did was with other commodity groups, and it was with other horse breeds, and I wanted to build consensus among as many constituents as I could so that when I was lobbying uh, Frankfurt or lobbying in Washington or lobbying, God forbid, the USDA, which is probably one of the toughest lobbying jobs we have. Is that right, Dr. Cox? And I'll say so too. We could talk about all the horses and all the numbers. It's kind of like the, the economic impact study that Dr. Stowe's group did. Uh, it was about all breeds. It was about the entire state of Kentucky. And, and those things were very important. But let me get back here then after the sales and stuff. What separates us from any other place in the world are the veterinarians that we have, are the blacksmiths that we have, the nutrition specialists that we have, um, the Gluck Center. There are fine veterinarians all over the world. And there are fine vet uh, blacksmiths, farriers all over the world, but not with the concentration that we have here in central Kentucky. Now, Dr. Brown just walked out to take a, a message. Dr. Brown is a partner in Haggard Equine Institute. We also have Root and Riddle Clinic. Those two clinics are the equivalent of Mayo and um, I'm going, well, I wasn't going to say John's Hop, Cleveland Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, excuse me. Um, senior moment, I'm allowed those, I'm allowed those. Uh, the, the concentration that are at those two clinics, and they're within one mile as a crow flies from each other. But people come here and bring their horses here because of the care that they're going to get. The farm managers that we have, there's good farm managers everywhere in the world. A lot of them are in Ireland. A lot of the Irish are here. <laughs> done, done their work as well. But these are the things that uh, comprise so that we are comfortable in saying that we are horse capital of the world. Last year at Keeneland, and I um, tipped my hat to Chauncey, 
he developed a marketing program, an international marketing program. It started when I hired him away from the Kentucky Department of Agriculture, but he only lasted three years with me. And he jumped ship and went over to Keeneland with my blessing, with my blessing. And he uh, helped develop this international marketing program of which last year there were buyers from 46 countries, six continents. He couldn't get Happy Feet to come on board. Come on, that's supposed to be funny. <laughs> Happy Feet, Disney, Antarctica. <laughs> All right, I know better than trying to tell jokes when you're doing that. But anyway, six continents uh, of people that have come to buy, and I'm sure they go back and look at the sales results from this past week that, uh, and in the November sale coming up, that, that it'll be equal uh, numbers. The studies that uh, Dr. Stowe and Dr. Garkovich did were very important for a number of reasons. One, was it 1970-something was when the last one was done before you did yours in 2012? Uh, that, that's, a, that's a long time in between studies to find out what the economic impact of the equine industry is to the Commonwealth. And just a, a few numbers, uh, Jill's papers said that the equine-related assets totaled $23.4 billion and that there was an equivalent of $1 billion in sales. Thoroughbred industry probably amounted to about 70% of that, I think. So the, the other breeds are very important, if 30% uh, there. Dr. Gargovich's study was done on a, a ag cluster and it involved all of agriculture, but it was limited to just Fayette County. Uh, Jill used her study to present it to an interim legislative committee on horse farming, if I'm not mistaken, uh, hoping to educate, if they are able to be educated, our great leaders in Frankfurt. Um, but Lori's was with Fayette County. It showed an economic impact for just this county of $2.4 billion, $66 million in income and sales taxes that are distributed to the general fund in Frankfurt from just a little old Fayette County. That Fayette County received about $7 million in occupational taxes and that one in nine jobs are ag-related in Fayette County. Um, another thing that I know and have known for a long time, they interviewed a number of people in our community about what they like about our community. And the quality of life kept popping up. Quality of life because of green space. Quality of life because of agriculture. Um, and that is a reason that many of us have participated in trying to protect that land. Um, you know, production agriculture and Toyota have something in common. They both manufacture a product. They may be manufacturing a calf, they may be manufacturing a lamb, they might be manufacturing a horse. Toyota's manufacturing a very nice automobile. But the difference is that their manufacturing plant is bricks and mortars. Our manufacturing plant is green space. My father-in-law was an IBMer. This was back in the 1950s. And IBM was opening a new plant here. And they were trying to recruit people from New York, Poughkeepsie, et cetera, to move to Lexington to work at this plant. And they had a difficult time because the image of Kentucky was poor state, uneducated, women were fat, pregnant, barefoot. Um, and so they were concerned about moving here. So the management decided to fly them into Lexington, Kentucky and they brought them in in the daylight. And anyone who has flown into Bluegrass Field, what do you see? Horses, green space, cattle grazing, white fences. Don't see the white fences anymore. We've gone to black, uh, I think. And that was a way that they used our industry, agricultural industry, to get these people to come to Lexington, which is, I thought, was very important. April, July, September, October, November. Horse sales, racing at Keeneland. The restaurant owners love us. 
the hotels love us. The automobile rental agencies, they love us. Uh, this is Christmas in those months to them. The, the, if, if there was not the horse industry here, they would not have the business that they have. And they're very appreciative of that. The other day at the sales, they also go to our retail stores. They love to go to the mall. Last Friday I was at the sales and Chauncey was introducing me to some people from Russia. Um, it was a one-way conversation because I didn't understand uh, their Russian language and they had one young lady who did speak English. And Chauncey asked them if uh, they were buying anything at the sale this day. This was Friday. And they said no, they were coming back Saturday, but they were going to the mall to do some shopping. They find value in our products here. So that's just another indicator of the, where the economic impact uh, of the horse industry had come from. At the end of October, the last week in October is going to be a fun time in Lexington. Party, party, party. <laughs> you know, with the Breeders' Cup coming here. Not only Breeders' Cup, we got a football game that night, you got a concert at Rupp Arena. This is going to be some kind. Of, well, the week leading up to the, to the Breeders' Cup, there's going to be all kinds of festival things going on downtown. I'm sure Jefferson Street will, will be packed, et cetera. Keeneland started preparing for this event uh, basically back at, uh, in May when they start erecting the chalets for extra seating they're going to have. The economic impact that the Breeders' Cup estimates for this week of in construction altogether is $65 million for, this, for the community. And it'll spread all over the state because Lexington cannot handle 45,000 people, of which probably 70% of them will be from out of town, to stay in hotels, et cetera. They'll be staying in hotels in Frankfurt, Richmond, Louisville. Uh, they'll be eating in restaurants all over the state. So it, it's not just benefiting Fayette County, it's going to benefit the, the entire state. Well, enough of the embellishing and the lies and the factual stuff. One of the things that I've really enjoyed is having the opportunity to speak to the college students here. Uh, I've spoken to Dr. Lawrence Class before, Elizabeth Labonte. Uh, Dr. Stuart Brown, who's in the, in the back there, he and I are on the regular tour with Drew Graham's class each semester. In fact, we are speaking to Drew Graham's class this evening. So I'm really on a speaking tour this week and stuff. But it, it, it gives me an opportunity to say some of the things that I've said to you all uh, about the importance of the horse industry. So, uh, the, and try and do away with the perception that it's all rich and wealthy people. It's not all rich and wealthy people. Uh, Yes, you read in the paper about the $2.1 million yearling that sold a couple of weeks ago, but they don't write about the one that didn't get a bid, or they don't write about the one that only brought $1,000, and those things did happen. And so the perception that many people have is that we're a rich and wealthy industry, and yes, we do have some people that are very wealthy, um, but, uh, and we're glad that we have those people. I just thought of something else. I wanna go back to the Breeders' Cup just a minute, if y'all don't mind. I learned that Bluegrass Airport is going to close down one runway uh, during the two days of the racing, the Friday and Saturday. It'll be the short runway that is used for uh, private planes most likely. Well, I know it is. They are going to use that runway as a parking lot for airplanes. <laughs> they are at capacity. Frankfurt is at capacity airport. Georgetown is at capacity. Now I can assure you that when you park in the economy parking lot at Bluegrass Airport and pay $7 a day, those airplanes are going to be paying a heck of a lot more money than that. <laughs> so anyway, to get back to the fun thing about being to talk to the class, and, and one of, uh, I think it was two years ago, Kyle Kelly, did any of you instructors have Kyle Kelly in, in class? Um, he, I saw him at, uh, we were talking about lobbying. And that's one of the things that I do in Drew's class. And I saw Kyle at the Kentucky State Fair this summer. And he came up and, and we were chatting and he said, I've decided that I want to be a lobbyist. And he's a very articulate young man, uh, presents himself well. Uh, his first job was with Kentucky Farm Bureau. He's now working the campaign for Ryan Qualls for Commissioner of Agriculture. Those are two good 
avenues to pursue to get down to the, his career goal of being a, a lobbyist. And I'm sure it will be a lobbyist dealing with agriculture. The role of a lobbyist, uh, and that was one of the roles that I played in, in the, the association management, is to build relationships, um, to coordinate with, in my opinion, all of agriculture. And this is what I did. I dealt with the Kentucky Cattlemen's Association, the Poultry Federation, the Dairy. I didn't like the poultry really because they have become the number one sales animal in production agriculture, overtaking the thoroughbred industry. But anyway, I got along with them. That was fine. We built relationships. Dr. Harmon mentioned about the diagnostic lab. That was a collaboration between the Cattlemen's Association, Drew Graham, myself, Kentucky Farm Bureau. Um, that took us eight years. You gotta have patience. You gotta have patience. Uh, if you're dealing with legislators, trying to get legislation passed. Um, that's not the longest uh, lobbying deal I was involved in, and I'll, I'm gonna mention that in just a minute. As Dr. Harmon said, I graduated in 1967. I started in 1963. Yes, I made it in four years. That was 52 years ago. But it took this college 42 years before we got an equine management and science program. <laughs> 42 years, you know, wow. And, and it was a great collaboration of folks that got behind that. When I was here in 1963 uh, in animal science, pre-vet student, didn't turn out that way, but that's okay. Uh, I was looking through my, the curriculum schedule. Dr. Frank Buck was, was my advisor. Well, I knew I had to take all these hard chemistry courses and physics courses and biology and all those things, but surely I could get some electives, and I wanted to find some electives in with equine. I looked through that book, I looked through that book. One class, two hour credit, qualified for physical ed. Back then, we were healthy students. We had to take so many credit hours in physical education, uh, and that qualified. It was a light horse husbandry class, how to ride a horse. Hmm. Horse capital world then, horse capital world today. So the collaboration, I think, happened out of a bit of adversity. When we had mere reproductive loss syndrome, out of that, <coughs> Dr. Cox, baptism by fire. She was new to the campus. Uh, and Dean Smith threw her right into the wolves. She helped us develop a task force. It included faculty members from vet science. It included faculty members from animal science. Uh, entomology got involved in it. Uh, the diagnostic lab. Veterinarians. Uh, Dr. Brown was one of them, of course. Uh, they were involved on the task force to try and solve what this MRLS was all about. We lost 30% of our foal crop in 2001, 45, about 4,500 foals that weren't born. But out of that, our industry prior to 2001 thought that the Gluck Center was the guru for our industry. If anything happened, that was a negative to our industry, we could go to the Gluck Center and they could solve the problem. That wasn't the case with MRLS because the Gluck Center was mainly focused on infectious disease at that time. And this was early on proven to not be an infectious disease. So there was a bit of negativism from the thoroughbred industry toward Gluck at that time because heretofore they hadn't relied on the whole College of Agriculture. But that changed because actually the majority of the $750,000 in research dollars that our industry put together uh, to try and solve this problem, a lot of it went to animal science and entomology. The bug colleges, I got to call them, with uh, Bruce Webb. Um, we never found out exactly what caused we know that the Eastern Tent Caterpillar had something to do with it. 
We learned that by managing our pastures and keeping the mare, the pregnant mares, off the pastures during the spring when the eastern tent caterpillars are around, that we're able to avoid those, those abortions. So we got something positive out of that. But the most positive thing I believe that came out of it is the appreciation for the college. Not just vet science, but for the entire college. The folks that were involved in those task force, the farm managers who realized that it was animal science and entomology that was doing the brunt of the research work. And um, you know, Dr. Lawrence was involved in some of the research. I think Dr. Coleman had done some of the stuff on the forages, et cetera. I think, who, what, which one of you decided that the horses would eat those caterpillars? No, that wasn't, wasn't a good one. But anyway, it became a positive. So out of a little bit of adversity, we now have a relationship not only with Gluck, we still have that relationship with Gluck, it's a fine, fine facility, but we also have a better understanding of the land-grant university and the College of Agriculture and what it can do to it. I was kidding uh, Dr. Harmon that I was going to have to talk about him a little bit in this thing, and I am. Um, I think when Dean Smith and, and Dr. Cox decided that they wanted to pursue a curriculum in equine science and management, the first thing they had to do was convince the faculty. Are you all willing to take on a little bit more teaching? Um, and they sold them on that. Dr. Harmon was told that we we're going to increase the enrollment and he got nervous because as the facilities manager, he was nervous we wouldn't have enough facilities and he's proven to be right. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one of the things we need to work on is getting some more buildings and stuff over here um, to do. But uh, with Dr. Stokes, uh, Leadership now, I think the equine management and science program is, is on solid grounds, 10 year anniversary this year. And yes, Dr. Coleman, I, I'm not going to complain that 99% of the students in the program are females. I, I've, I've gotten accustomed to that. Uh, we can go, we can just go forward, forward on forward with that. You know, not all of our lobbying uh, experience were turned out positive, although I'm not real sure this, is, we can, I can say it's a negative, but to show that. Uh, our association and myself did get involved in other lobbying issues with other production agriculture groups. We met with the Bluegrass Stockyards folks when they were wanting to move off Lyle Road and move out to the I-64-75 sector uh, going north. Um, met with them, met with the barbers, met with uh, John, Jim Akers, Jim Akers, uh, met with our industry veterinarians met some of our farm managers trying to figure out if we could solve this little problem. They needed more room, needed more space and stuff. Um, it didn't work out because the Kentucky Horse Park out lobbied us, basically. And uh, Dr. Cox reminded me the other day of the phone call that I made to inform the dean that the governor had called and pretty well nixed the deal. Uh, so that was something that we got out lobbied on. I get out lobbied on a lot of things, really. I don't just don't talk about those, you know, things. So, but I, I think the the one thing I'm, I am pleased is that we do have our industry, the thoroughbred industry, has a wonderful working relationship with the college. Now I will say, with my successor in the room, that Dr. Cox has her work cut out to get him on board as well. But I think he will. He's back there smirking. As I'm saying that, <laughs> but uh, it, it has been a, a wonderful relationship that I've experienced over the years, um, and the recognition that I'm receiving with this award is special. And you know, President Truman might have had it right. It's amazing what you can achieve when you don't care who gets the credit. Thank you all very much. I think that there's possibility questions and answer time. You want to do that? Yeah, I think we've got until maybe 10 up before they start knocking on the door in the next class. Um, just to clarify, 
David will officially receive the Animal Food Science Distinguished Alumnus Award uh, Friday night. Uh, 5.30 is our Animal Food Science Communion, and everybody is welcome, of course, to, to attend. We also give uh, a Hall of Fame Award that night. But we have lots of meat to eat, and there is no horse being served. <laughs> okay, so uh, just to clarify, and I promise you, I will not be as winded as I am here. I, I've, I've got two. I got two acceptance speeches that, that I use. I have a short one. It's called "Thank You," and I have a long one. "Thank You Very Much." <laughs> so, questions? Why? Why open? Why open? I would hope that you're here not for sport, but for a business or management science type degree in this. Uh, I would venture to say that a high percentage of the students in this program come from a background of writing. And I'm saying that because I serve on the board of the uh, Kimmy internship program. And when I review applications of students who want to come to that program, 99.9% .9 of them have writing experiences. Now, that's not to say that, I know there's been discussions about having writing team, do we not in that? I'm looking at Dr. Cox, excuse me, that we, we you know, we've even talked about qualifying for the NCAA type thing, with Mr. Barnhart. Yeah, yeah. yeah, which would involve then having writing involved there so it is po yes anything is possible uh, that, that there could be some more stuff in into the writing part yeah oh. so so David when, when other people claim that they are the horse capital of the world what what's the, the general reaction do you jokingly pick up the phone and say, can we talk about this, or do you just kind of say, well... Well, early on, uh, the uh, executive director of the Florida Thoroughbred Breeders and Owners, he, uh, he was quite adamant he wanted to sue us. And he claimed that he had a patent or a trademark on it, and we found out, we, we, we just didn't take his word. <laughs> uh, we found out that you couldn't trademark that particular type thing. And so when I explained to him the reason why we're doing this, when I gave him the economics of it, um, he was disappointed because he had spent money to put a billboard up in Ocala, Florida, claiming to be the horse cap of the world. And I informed him that we spent $30,000 painting a water tank at the corner of I-64 and 75, <laughs> picturing horses with the horse cap of the world on there. There's kind of a cute story that goes along with that. When, when I was out raising the money to do that mural, uh, I went to a gentleman in this community by the name of Alex Campbell. He's responsible for the Triangle Park Foundation that where you all do your ice skating at Christmas time down there and stuff. And, and I'd raised uh, quite a bit of the money that, that we needed, but uh, still needed about 10, 15,000 to go. Went to him and he said, I wish you'd have come to me first. I'd have done the whole thing. The foundation would have done the whole thing. But he said, I'm going to get you the rest of the money that you need, but you've got to have one, I've got one stipulation. He said, Mr. Young, and I assume many of you all have been to the library over here, W.T. Young Library. I should have gone more uh, when I was here. But anyway, he and Mr. Young were very competitive, and they were businessmen together. And every time they had a horse in a race against one another, they would bet a dollar as to whose horse was going to win. Now, he could come in eighth and the other one ninth. It didn't necessarily have to win the race. But he said, just whichever one of the horses crossed the finish line before the other. He said, David, I want my silks painted on the lead horse. <laughs> and Mr. Young's painted on the second horse. <laughs> True story. 
he took Mr. Young out to the, uh, see the tank after it was completed. He turned to him and said, Bill, you owe me a dollar. <laughs> But then anyway, we just went ahead and did it. <laughs> and it stuck. And Lori? I noticed when you drive out of the airport that Lexington is a sister city to a number of other cities. Have you been involved in that program? Have. I have not. I have not. A financial advisor has. He keeps going to Deauville to <laughs> do things and stuff. But no, we didn't have any, really didn't have anything to do with the sister city stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you kind of mentioned that it's the third world industry is not just for the rich, and I'm just wondering what kind of role people that aren't rich play in the industry. Are there owners that are middle income people, and do they have successful racehorses? Not that they're a red person yet. Oh sure, um, it's, uh, there were horses that were sold out there, this, these yearlings, for five, ten thousand uh, dollars. Most of the people that are involved in our industry are using discretionary income to participate, and particularly at the high end. It's a very risky business, but there's a great reward for it. Um, Mr. Zayat, who bred American Pharaoh, uh, not just what he's earned on the racetrack here, that's penance compared to what he's going to earn in the breeding shed. He's already been sold uh, to one of the stud farms for mega bucks. That is a rich reward. Now, as far as someone, um, I did not come from a wealthy family. I got my hands dirty working on a farm, turning it, helping to build it into a thoroughbred operation. I mucked stalls. I cleaned feet. I worked on the racetrack as a grunt groom hot walker. And I ended up here. So uh, there's all kinds of opportunities in, in the horse industry. And um, I'll tell you another little story about myself. Before I became the association director, I owned a small business. I insured horses and I acted as a bloodstock agent, which is similar to a realtor. Bought and sold horses for customers, clients, and dabbled in them for ourselves, my wife and I. So we owned some horses, brood mares, a couple in racing. And one day my wife came to me and she said, we need to have a talk. Now fellas, if you've ever had that experience, you know what's getting ready to happen. It's not gonna be good. So we sat down and she said, David, the horses are eating better than we are. They're traveling more than we are. And I'm gonna give you an opportunity, a choice. You can either have a dispersal sale or an estate sale. Which would you like to do? <laughs> it happened at an appropriate time. It's when I then took the uh, position at the association and the board at that time thought it would be a conflict of interest if I did own horses because I'd be in competition with the people that were negotiating my contract, you know. So K one out on that one. <laughs> and I did too because I'm alive. Yeah. a little bit. I was, I was really interested after the last sale. I read a, an article about one of the horses that Mandy Pope bought and she said something about how the increase in partnerships is making it more difficult to buy the horses. Thanks Ernie. Can you talk about the importance of these racing partnerships and buying partnerships to the industry and its, its future? Yeah, they've kind of been going on for two or three years and there has been a concern that um, you're taking some players out of, you always need an underbidder on a horse, and, and you're kind of taking some of the top end players out of it. Um, you know, I, I think, um, well that's what's happened. Stone Street has been buying horses with uh, Mr. Bolton for a couple years. Uh, Mr. Bolton was involved in it this year, wasn't he, Chauncey? With uh, that, and um, now did, did Mandy, was hers in a partnership? At 2.1 million, I thought she just bought that out herself. Yeah. 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 It does take a one or two less buyers out of the market, but what they the reason they're doing it, they were all on the same horse, and there's no sense in beating on each other if they can spread their spread their money and maybe buy more horses. So it can turn out to be a positive if they if they pool their resources on one horse, then what they pooled, what they saved, 
say they were going to they were going to spend a million dollars where they ended up only spending 500 they got five hundred thousand dollars over there to go buy some horses so i don't know if it'll be a negative i have to wait and see yes you said something about lexington having a lot of green space in the Bay county in general from a non-horse person's point of view it looks like a lot of unused green space like it's just pasture that gets mowed all the time. I know it's one of the countries that gets used for hay or alfalfa, things like that. Do producers or owners in Kentucky with their farms, do they do the same thing? Use it for other things besides just empty pasture until another horse, horse comes on it? Some, some do. Some will uh, <clears throat> raise their own hay for their horses, primarily for bedding. Uh, Dr. Coleman can, can speak on that as well. Uh, because the land you don't want to overgraze the land, and you need to do rotation. Uh, when I was first starting out in the industry at the age of 13, we wrote the, the farms around here rotated their pastures with horses, cattle, and sheep. Sheep, this used to be the second largest sheep producing state in the United States. I can talk for an hour on why it's not anymore, but anyway. Um, so they would rotate their pastures because they eat a different level of the legumes. <clears throat> now we don't mix horses with the cattle and the sheep. We don't have the sheep very much in, anymore. Uh, so they like to rest their pastures and not allow anything to be on it. And that's why you'll see a lot of open space not being used. Is that okay? Uh oh. Instant racing. <laughs> I didn't read the article in the paper this morning. Um, <clears throat> well, instant, ra instant racing is our industry's answer to full blown casinos. Uh, I don't think that, that that will ever happen in the Commonwealth of Kentucky to have full blown casinos. We're at a state now <clears throat> where it probably would be detrimental to us to have full-blown casinos because we're bringing competition in to compete with our industry. And we're seeing where states that do have alternative forms of gaming, where they were giving part of the money to the horse industry, they're now taking it away from them. And it's because of budget restraints. And so what, what the government giveth, the government can take it away. I think we apply that to somebody else. but. Uh, that is a negative to it. So the instant racing has been very successful at Kentucky Downs in Simpson County. Um, it's not a game that I particularly care to play. Uh, I, I don't play those kind of machines if I go to Las Vegas even, so it's, it's not something that really appeals to me, but it does appeal to certain segments of, of folks. And if, is, if the one at the Red Mile is as successful as the one at Kentucky Downs, it's going to play a big role in increasing our purses at, at Keeneland, for sure. And they're going to be building a racetrack in Corbin. It's going to be a quarter horse racetrack. And we'll be sharing in revenues with that one as well. Uh, Kay and I, my wife, and I went over to the Red Mile last Thursday. It's beautiful. It's nice. 900 and some machines. Bells ringing. There were about 25 or 30 people in there. In defense, they, they had not started advertising. So hopefully it, it, it will. There's, there's some plans, I think, uh, that the Red Mile might be unveiling in the not too distant future about helping to make that more of a destination place to come visit. Dr. Lawrence is going to ask me what am I talking about there since her husband is involved in that industry. <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs>